My dear brothers and sisters, I invite you to our session today. My name is Steven Mbogua Doidi from the Archdiocese of Mombasa, Kenya. And today I want to talk about uh, the sacrament of penance and reconciliation as one aspect of knowing our faith. We need to know our faith. We need to understand our faith because faith and reason, they go together. They go hand in hand. Many things, if not all things that are done in the church can be explained with reason. Of course, faith is much wider than reason. But many people tend to think that some things that we do, especially in the Catholic Church, is like uh, it's just out of human uh, uh, making. But it is not. And especially the sacrament of penance and reconciliation is one sacrament but that many people have misunderstood. Many people have also misused it for not understanding. And I hope today, with the few minutes that we have, we'll be able to understand it in a deeper sense and take it to the seriousness that it deserves. We really need to understand that sins have degrees. We have degrees of sins, and sin grows. Or basically, there are different levels or weights of sins. But when you go outside the Catholic Church, you'll be told that sin is sin. But in the Word of God, it is very clear that we have different degrees of sins. In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, I'll start with that one. Remember, this letter has been written after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because many people there will claim that when Jesus died, the curtains were separated. And so there's no need of going through anybody else. We go directly. That is very true. But we are going to see what the word of God is telling us today. In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, the word of God tells us clearly, but people are tempted when they are drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires. People are tempted and drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires. So I want to start explaining from there. When a person is holy, the first level away from holiness is desire. When you are baptized, you become holy. And if you die in that state, you go straight to heaven. But the first level to pull away from holiness is normally desire. You are walking around, you see a handsome man, you see a cute girl, and you start having desire. That is normally the first step to pull you away from holiness. And if you are not careful, the desire will lead you to sin. So James is telling us, but people are tempted when they are drawn away and trapped by their own desires. Verse 15 says, then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin. That is the next level. So from holiness, the first level is desire. Then the desire conceives and gives birth to sin. That is the next level from holiness to desire to sin. But this sin is not mortal sin. This is not the sin that leads you to death. This is not the sin that leads you to hell. It goes on to say, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So we are seeing we have four stages. From holiness, we have desire, we have venial sin, sin that does not lead you to death, and we have mortal sin, sin that leads you to death. So in the word of God, even after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is so clear that we have different degrees of sins. And God cannot treat these people the same way. And even when they die, a person who dies in holiness straight away goes to heaven. A person who dies in mortal sin, the sin that is fully grown, which gives to death. When you die in mortal sin, you go straight away to hell. But what about the ones who die in desire and in venial sin? The sin which has not fully matured. They cannot go to heaven because they are not completely clean and nothing unclean will enter heaven. And they cannot go to hell because their sin had not matured to fully grown. It had not matured to death. So God cannot be so unfair to send that kind of a person to hell. So these are the people who go to purgatory. The ones who die in venial sin and in desire. So that they can be cleansed before they enter heaven. So when the Catholic Church teaches that we have purgatory, it is definitely the truth. It is not guesswork. In my book, No Reason for Division, I've dealt with this topic and purgatory in depth. You can get more notes there. Today we have a few minutes to be able to share. So when you die in holiness, straight to heaven. When you die in mortal sin, sin that is fully grown, straight to hell. In that state, no amount of prayer will get you from hell. So we need to understand that even as Catholics, we don't need to live reckless. Because when you live reckless, you actually take yourself straight away to hell. And once you're in hell, you can't come out. The story of the rich fool and Lazarus gives us some hint. 
Abraham is telling the rich fool. When the rich fool is saying, Abraham, tell Lazarus to pour one drop of water upon me. And Abraham tells him, you are side and our side. There's a big trench in between. And no one can come to your side. And neither can we come from our side to your side. So you can't leave hell and come back. The people who have hope are the people who are living a good life, striving to please God, but they never died in full grace. So they're the ones who need cleansing to be able to enter heaven, as nothing and clean will enter heaven. So once in hell, you're in hell. The people you pray for all the time are the souls in purgatory, the souls in prison. Those are the ones that we pray for. So remember we have holiness, we have desire, we have venue sin, and we have mortal sin. What is the difference between venue and mortal sin? The difference is, if you go to the Catholic, the Catholic of the Catholic Church, you are going to get deeper description of the difference. But the most basic one that I give you, I can give you for today, is when you've committed a sin in your mind. For example, Jesus says, when you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery. That is a venial sin. That's a small sin. But when you actually go and physically commit the sin, it's already mortal. You're already in death. Your soul and spirit is dead. Or your soul is dead. The spirit is dead. And in that case, if you die, you go straight to hell. You come and tell me there's a deal we can make some money. And maybe it's a crooked deal. If I start thinking of stealing, how we are going to kill somebody, make some money in that way. I've already committed the sin in my mind. That is venial sin. But when you physically go and steal, that is mortal sin. You're watching television. They bring a, bad pro a, 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 a pornographic movie. And you continue watching. In your mind, you start committing adultery. If you go and physically commit it, you have gone, gotten into mortal sin. So that is the key difference. Some sins, you commit them in our mind. They are not yet major. But when you go and actualize it, then you're already in mortal sin. So you can even think about it. You can even tell when you're in mortal sin and then you're sin. Because then you're sin is a, mean that you're is a sin that you're committing intentionally. You know this is sin and you're actually going to commit it. You're thinking of aborting. Already that is a sin. Thinking about it is already a small sin. But when you go and abort, you actually kill. That is a mortal sin. So when you die in venial sin or desire, you cannot enter heaven until you're cleansed. There is some sanctification. And you cannot go to hell because your sin is not fully mature. So that is the main difference. So God has a will in these four states. Like I said earlier, if you die in holiness, you go straight to, to heaven. If you die in mortal sin, you go straight to hell because already your, your, your spirit is dead. But if you die in desire and then you sin, you basically go to purgatory. What about when you're alive? How does God treat these, dif this, these different cases? Of course, when you're holy, that is the state that God wants you to be. When you're in desire and then you sin, what does God say? In 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 to 17. The first letter of John, chapter 5, verse 14 to 17. Again, remember this letter is written after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because many people quote and say, after Jesus is dead, we can go direct. But I want you to hear what the word of God says. Verse 14 says, We have the courage in God's presence because we are sure that he hears us if we ask him for anything that is according to his will. I want you to clearly hear those words. When we ask for anything that is according to his will, even after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, even after the curtain separated and we have a direct way to God, it must be according to his will. You cannot go to God outside his will and you claim that he's still going to listen to you. We are creation. We are creatures. God is a creator. So he's the one who's speaking. He's the one who's directing. We cannot make our own laws our own rules, our own regulations, or we cannot decide what is according to the will of God and what is not. It is him who gives us direction what is according to his will. And in these four states, holy, desire, venue, and motto, God has his will. Verse 16 says, If you see your brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, mark the words, if you see your brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, that means desire and venial sin, not mortal sin. I read again. If you see your brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray to God who will give them life. This is absolutely clear. This letter is written after the death 
and resurrection of Jesus. The curtain has already separated. And God is telling his will about venue and mortal sin. And he's saying, if you see your brother commit a sin that is not deadly, that does not lead to death, that is not mortal, pray for him or her, and God will give them back life. What does giving them back life mean? Basically means becoming holy again. Remember, what kills our spirit is sin. So when God is saying, when you pray to, for that kind of a pastor, they are given back life, they, are, they get back the grace of God, the full grace of God, and they become holy again. I continue to read. This applies to those whose sins do not lead to death. But there is sin which leads to death, and I do not say they should pray to God about that. Very clear. There is sin that leads to death, and I do not tell you they should pray about that. So this letter is even telling you, of course, it can't stop you from praying for yourself. You are going to pray for yourself for every sin. But it is so clear that sin that leads to death, mortal sin, you cannot pray for yourself and you are given back life. You cannot pray for yourself and the sin is removed. It's so clear. Verse 17 says, All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin which does not lead to death. There is venial and mortal sin. And this is what the Catholic Church has taught for ages. But many people have condemned the church for teaching that way. Yet it is so clear in the word of God. We have venial sin, we have mortal sin. And the Bible has told us clearly, the will of God, praying according to the will of God, you can pray for venial sin and you are forgiven. What does that mean? Even when you go for Holy Mass and you are starting Mass, and we pray the prayer of, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, all the people in venial sin, not mortal, venial sin, who sincerely repent and they have decided they are changing their ways, they are mending their ways, they are forgiven there and then and they become holy immediately. They receive back life. So you can pray for yourself. We can maintain holiness. How can you do that? If you are walking on the road and you see a beautiful girl or a handsome guy and you feel your, your mind is moving away, you can decide to look away Pray for yourself. Seek the grace of God to cleanse you, the blood of Jesus. Pray for holiness to come back or the, the Holy Spirit of God to come and renew you and give you life back again. And immediately you're forgiven, you become anew. You're watching television. They bring a dirty movie. You can decide to change the program or switch off and pray for yourself. In that state, you get back your holiness. They come and tell you about a deal and you discover this deal of making money is going to get you into sin. And you pray for yourself and you ask God for forgiveness. You get back your life immediately. You become holy again. And then you pray for the people who are telling you about the dirty deal. You pray, you pray for the lady or the gentleman who is making you have the lustful desires. Especially nowadays, you walk in the street, you find many ladies, many ladies nowadays, they dress exposed. They expose themselves and this touches men. So when I see that kind of a lady, I look away, I pray for myself, for the grace of God to infill me again, to renew me again. Then I pray for that lady, for God to help her to cover herself. Her private parts and her private parts is not for the others to see. If you're married, it is for your spouse and not for the public. So the word of God is so clear that there is sin that leads to death and there is sin that does not lead to death. And sin that does not lead to death, we can pray for ourselves and be forgiven. But sin that leads to death, we cannot pray for ourselves and be forgiven. It is very clear. Our brothers outside the Catholic Church will always quote the part of the Bible where God says, confess to one another. That is true. Confessing to one another does not include absolving each other from sin. Confessing to one another basically means when I have wronged you, I'll come to you and seek forgiveness. We will share and talk about the issue and forgive each other. That is confessing to one another. But nowhere in that word does God say, now absolve each other's sin. Absolutely not. For mortal sin, the only way that you can be forgiven, in accordance to the word of God, the directions given by Jesus himself, after his death and resurrection is in John chapter 20, verse 19 to 23. John chapter 20, verse 19 to 23, and I read. It was late that Sunday evening, and the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors. They were afraid. Jesus had been killed, and they were afraid that they were also going to be killed. I continue reading. Because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, their leader, their master, their king is already killed. 
They thought they would be killed. They're in the upper room. They locked themselves. Jesus has died. The curtain has separated. Now he's resurrected. I continue reading. Then Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. He knew they had no peace. He knew they needed peace. So the first thing he speaks to them is peace be with you. Even you, my dear listener and viewer, even in a state of mortal sin, may the peace of the Lord be with you. Because God has never left us without a way out. He did not die for nothing. He has given a way out of this situation. But remember, when you sin, you can pray for yourself and you're forgiven. Mortal sin, listen to what Jesus says after resurrecting. Verse 20. After saying this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were filled with joy at seeing the Lord. They were so happy when they saw the wounds, the marks on his hands and on his side. They were so happy because they were so sure he has resurrected as he said. They were excited, just like you would be. The person you are depending on. He had said you die and resurrect, but you never trusted the word. Now he's alive and you have seen the marks. You have confirmed it is him. They were very happy. They were joyous. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again a second time, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. So the Lord is saying, I was sent by my Father. I have come. And there is part of the job that I was sent that I want to send you. The few who are there, the apostles who are there, not the whole world. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He gives them power and authority, the heavenly power and authority, the anointing for that particular job. Remember, Jesus knows very well that Pentecost is coming. After his ascension, Pentecost is coming. But he doesn't wait for Pentecost. For this particular anointing, he gives it to a small group of people on this particular day. On Pentecost day, everybody receives the Holy Spirit, but does not receive this particular anointing. This was for a few the apostles of Jesus, for a particular mission, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 23, if you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Precise words, clear, from none other but our Lord and our God, from none other but our Savior, who we claim to follow. We call ourselves Christians, yet we want to ignore these words of the Lord himself. Not even by a prophet, by Jesus himself. He gave man authority and power, heavenly, to forgive sin just like he has power and authority to forgive. He has given it to men. And these men are not angels. They are weak. They are just like you and me. In those men, among them was Petro, our first pope, who had denied him three times by gives him the power and authority to be able to forgive sins. Among these men was Thomas, who was always a doubter. He was given the power and authority to forgive sin. So Jesus knew that the people is living this authority. They are not perfect. They are human beings. They have their own weaknesses. And we need to pray for them because of their weaknesses. But the anointing, the power, and authority, nobody can remove it. Because it is heavenly given, ordained from heaven, not by any human being. So the question to you is, are you going to listen to Jesus or to people out there? Are you going to listen to the wisdom of all wisdom or partial wisdoms of human beings who will tell you why you're going to a human being? That question you should ask Jesus because he's the one who gave the power and authority to human beings to be able to forgive sins. It's a choice. You can choose to obey the word of God and his will or you create your own will which is outside the will of God. And he said clearly, when you pray according to his will, he listens to us. So the question is, to you who's listening to me and viewing me, where do you take your mortal sins? When you sin, you can pray for yourself. But mortal sin, you cannot pray for yourself and absolve yourself. Where to be absolved, Jesus has given direction. He has left the sacrament of penance and reconciliation. So we can't be reconciled to him. This is a healing sacrament, is a saving sacrament. It's one of the ways that Jesus left for our salvation. We need to humble ourselves, listen to Jesus. Obey his word. Humble ourselves. Go to that person who was given that grace, that anointing. Confess our sins without hiding. And when he speaks the word, by the power conferred to me by Jesus, in the verse that we just read, I absolve you from your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, you become holy again. And if you die in that state, you go straight to hell because you are holy. He does not forgive your sins in his own name. He forgives you in the name of Jesus, 
who gave him power and authority. In the name of the Father in heaven, who sent Jesus and Jesus sent us. He sent them to come and forgive our sins. So really, my dear fellow Catholics, don't be afraid to utilize this sacrament. Use it with boldness and use it well. When you're going to confession, you are meant to go for confession after sincerely thinking, introspecting, deciding, making a decision, and a firm purpose of amending, not to go back to the sins that you're going to confess. You cannot go to confess and you're planning to commit that sin again. That is misusing the sacrament. It actually amounts to religious sin. In the confession box, you're committing another sin. So we need to take it seriously, especially during this period of Lent, during the period of the way of the cross. It's a painful way that Jesus had to go through to save you and to save me. Let us not misuse the sacrament. Jesus left it for a purpose, so we can mend our ways. And why did the Lord make it that we have to go to a human being? So that we can be ashamed, be humiliated, and pained so as not to repeat the sin again. That is the main purpose. When you commit the sin and you do it like our brothers out there, quietly, I murdered, I commit adultery, there is no pain. But when you have to go and tell somebody else, it's already so humiliating, it's already so painful, it's already so ashaming. So the purpose for me to be ashamed, not to repeat the sin again. Does that mean that Catholics, because they're ashamed, they go there and they become good people? Not necessarily. But that does not disqualify the sacrament. The sacrament remains holy and ordained from heaven. It will remain there. Whether others are misusing it, there are those who are using it well for the glory of the kingdom of God. So the choice is yours. The choice is mine. To utilize the sacraments of the church in accordance to the, to the, to the holy will of God. Knowing our faith is absolutely important. Understanding the sacrament of penance and reconciliation is very important so that you can use it well. Don't ask me about our brothers who are outside the Catholic Church, how they are forgiven their mortal sin. I know no other way. Nobody has shown me any other way from the Word of God. But I know it is clear in the Word of God that there are those who are anointed to forgive sin. Where they take them, I don't know. Remember, many are called, few are chosen. Many will be shocked. To reach out there and say, Jesus, you know I got saved, I've been saved. And you're told I don't know you. Because you never obeyed the word of God. Let's obey the word of God as it is, not as you wish. It's not about your wish. It's not about your will. It's all about the will of God. I finished this teaching with the book of Sirach, chapter 15, verses 14 to 17. Where God says that God in the beginning created human beings and made them subject to their own free choice. God created us. And gave us the freedom to choose. You have the power in you to choose. Even today you have that power. You can decide to return to this sacrament of penance and reconciliation. As a Catholic, remove every block to return to it. And if you left the church, you can come back to the church of Christ. So that you experience this sacrament. Because it is nowhere else but the church, the church, the church that Christ started, initiated, and left and gave the power and authority to be able to forgive all sins, venial and mortal. You can come back home. In the Father's house, there are many rooms. You are never chased away. It is for you to humble yourself. Swallow the humble pie. Come back and say, I made a wrong mistake. So you can utilize this sacrament. It is nowhere else. Verse 15 says, if you choose, you can keep the commandments. Loyalty is doing the will of God. If you choose, if you want, you can obey the commandments of God. He will not force you. But if you want, you can obey. He says, set before you a fire and water. To whatever you choose, stretch out your hand and pick. Before you there is fire and water. Choose. Life and death. Choose. Whichever you choose, the Lord says clearly, it will be given to you. Even in this particular situation, holiness, desire, venial sin and mortal, mortal sin, there is the will of God. Stop applying your will and your standards and your way. The human wisdom is such a little amount of wisdom. For us to argue from that point of view. Verse 17 says, Before everyone are life and death, whichever they choose will be given them. Life and death. And for you to choose life, you must choose to obey the word of God. Not intentionally ignoring it because it does not suit what you want it to be. It's not about you. It's not about me. We are creatures. We have our creator who directs us. And in this particular situation, for mortal sin, we have to humble ourselves and go to the sacrament of salvation that forgives sin, 
revives our soul and spirit so that we have life again. We have eternal life. And when we die, we have the kingdom of God to live in the delightful presence of God forever and ever. Let us pray. Heavenly Lord and King, we want to thank you. Thank you for wanting us to understand our faith, to understand that faith and reason go together, to understand that all the seven sacraments, you initiated them, and the sacrament of penance and reconciliation is a sacrament of healing, is a sacrament of deliverance, is a sacrament of our salvation, gives us back our all. The purpose for which you suffered on the way of the cross, died and resurrected, is all left in that sacrament of penance and reconciliation so that we can receive in body and spirit the food for the journey to heaven so that we can be blessed here, we can be healed here, we can be protected here and eventually be within a delightful presence forever and ever. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, trust and believe. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'd wish to continue receiving this every Saturday teachings and the ones in a while weekday reflections and some of the live audience teachings now and more subscribe to this YouTube channel Steve Wayesu by clicking on the subscription button and then ensure to also click on the notification bell to get a notification message on your phone as soon as a presentation is uploaded See you in the next teaching. God is in control and he loves you dearly. Stay blessed always. Bye-bye.